omnipotence and omnipresence of God and his justice. Revelations of Jesus Christ from 1884 to 1950. The power of God, thus saith the Lord. If modern man, with all his scientific knowledge, is unable to subjugate the forces of nature, how then could he impose his strength upon the spiritual forces? All the stars and planets across the cosmos follow their inalterable order, and there is absolutely nothing the will of man can do to change their course or destiny, and no one may change the order that exists within the spiritual. I created day and night, for I am the light, and none but I may withhold it. It is the same for the spiritual. If you believe in me, you must trust that my strength is infinitely greater than that of the sins of men, and so, when sin yields before the light of truth and justice, man and his life must change as well. Can you imagine life in this world when men carry out the will of God? To me, the repentance of a being, its regeneration and salvation simply cannot be an impossibility. I would not be the Almighty if men were stronger than me. Do you imagine my power to be inferior to the strength of evil within men? Do you believe human darkness to be superior to the divine light? Never, your heart tells me. Remember this, my mission, having granted you your existence, is to guide you towards perfection and to unite all of you in a single spiritual family. Do not forget, my will is done above all. I, the Divine Sower, imperceptibly place my seed of love in each and every spirit. Only I know when this seed will germinate among all humanity, and I alone, with infinite patience, am capable of waiting for my works to come to fruition. I wish not to humiliate you with my greatness, and neither to make a display of it, but nonetheless I demonstrate it to you according to my will, so you may feel the supreme joy of having as your Father a God all-powerful, wise, and perfect. Rejoice at the thought that you will never see the end of my power, and the greater the elevation of your spirit, the clearer you shall see me. Who would feel dissatisfied knowing that he would never reach the greatness of his father? On this earth, were you not satisfied being younger than your earthly father? Have you not willingly conceded to him both experience and authority? Have you not rejoiced at the realization that you have as a father a man stronger than you, proud, courageous, and brimming with virtues? What is the strength of men compared to my power? What opposition could the materialist peoples render against the infinite strength of spiritualization? Nothing. I have allowed man to approach the limits of his ambitions, the very farthest reaches of his arrogance, to prove that the gift of free will with which he was endowed by his father is real. However, once man reaches this limit, he will awaken in spirit, and he will pursue spiritual enlightenment and love. He will kneel before my presence, subjugated by the absolute power and universal truth, that of God himself. The presence of God in all creation. I dwell not in any particular place, nor in any limited capacity, for I am present everywhere, across all of eternity. I am present in all that is divine, spiritual and material. You cannot point in the direction of my kingdom. 
When you look up at the sky, pointing towards the heavens, do so only symbolically, for your planet turns without ceasing, and every moment it presents to you new skies and new heights. Thus I say to you that there is no distance between us. The only thing that separates you from me are the forbidden and impure deeds you place between your spirit and my perfect law. The greater your purity, the more elevated will be your deeds, the more constant your faith, the closer, more intimate and more accessible to your prayers you will feel me. In like manner, when you separate yourselves from that which is good, just and righteous, and continue to live a life of materialism and selfishness, you will inevitably feel me ever more distant from you. The more you separate your hearts from the fulfillment of my law, the less likely are you to feel my divine presence. Understand why I proclaim my word at this time and in this form, to prepare you for the communication from spirit to spirit. Believing that I am all too distant from you, you did not know how to come to me. I have sought you to have you feel my divine presence, and to show you that, between the Father and his children, there is no distance to separate them. In case you believe that I have left my throne to proclaim myself to you, then you are in error. For this throne, you imagine, does not exist. Thrones are for vain and arrogant men. My spirit, being infinite and omnipotent, does not inhabit a fixed location. It is everywhere, in every place both spiritual and material. Where is this throne? you attribute to me. Cease giving me a material form, sitting upon a throne such as the ones on earth. Release me from this human form you always attribute to me. Stop dreaming of a heaven that your human mind is incapable of comprehending. When you free yourselves from all that, it will be as though you have broken the chains that bound you, as though a high wall crumbles before your very eyes as though a thick cloud has dissipated, allowing you to behold the horizon without limits, an infinite, luminous firmament, one that is nonetheless accessible to the spirit. Some say that God dwells in heaven, others say that God dwells in the beyond, but neither know what they say, nor what they believe. Certainly I inhabit the heavens, but not any particular location as you have imagined. I inhabit the heavens of light, of power, of love, of wisdom, of justice, of happiness, and of perfection. My universal presence permeates everything. There is no vacuum anywhere in the universe, for all of it is saturated with me. I have told you that I am so near to you, that I am aware of your most intimate thoughts. I am always with you, for I am present everywhere. I am the light that illuminates your mind and inspires you. I am within you, for I am the spirit that animates you, your conscience that judges you. I am part of your material senses and your physical body for I dwell throughout all creation. Feel my presence evermore within you, and all throughout nature. Thus, when you depart from this world, you will fully enter the spiritual life, and your spirit will feel no distress due to the effects of the material body. This will enable you to take another step closer to me. I, who am a fountain of infinite purity, from which you will drink eternally. Do you know the origin of the light dwelling in the word that pours from the lips of the spokesman? It originates from what is good, the divine love, the universal light 
that emanates from God. It is a beam or a spark of that luminous all that gives you life. It is part of the infinite power that moves all, beneath which everything vibrates, palpitates, and turns without ceasing. That is what you call the divine emanation. It is the light of the divine spirit that illuminates and gives life to the spirits. This emanation manifests itself over both the spiritual as well as the material, over worlds and men, over the plants and all the other beings of creation. It is spiritual to the spirit and material to matter. It is intelligence for understanding, and it is love within the hearts. It is science, it is talent, and it is self-reflection. It is instinct and intuition, and it stands above the senses of all beings, according to their order, their constitution, their species, and their degree of development. But its origin is one alone, God, and its essence is solely this, love. How then could it be impossible for me to illuminate the minds of these beings, to send you a message of spiritual light? The plants receive the emanation of life my spirit sends them, so they might bring forth fruit. The heavenly bodies receive the force emanating from my spirit in order to circle their orbits. The earth, the present living proof within reach of all your senses, receives the emanation that allows so many marvels to spring from its bosom unceasingly. Why then should it be impossible for man, within whom the presence of a spirit shines like a jewel, within which he bears his resemblance to me, to receive directly from my spirit this divine emanation, the spiritual seed which must bear fruit within him? Not a single sigh of yours remains unheard in heaven. Not a single prayer fails to echo within me. None of your tribulations or crises go unnoticed by my fatherly love. I know all, hear all, and see all, for I am present within all. Men, believing that I have abandoned them on account of their sins, have come to feel me distant from them. O oh, human ignorance, you who has brought such bitterness upon their lips, Understand that if I were to distance myself from any of my creations, they would cease to exist in that same instant. But this has never been, nor shall it ever be, for upon giving you a spirit, I also granted you eternal life. Strokes of Fate Curse not the trials that burden you and all of humanity. Say not that they are a punishment the anger or the revenge of God, for you blaspheme. I tell you that these trials are precisely what brings humanity closer to salvation. Call them justice, atonement, or lessons, and you will be correct. Anger and desire for revenge are human passions, characteristic of beings still far from bliss, harmony, and perfection. It is simply not right for you to apply the vulgar name of punishment or the unworthy name of revenge to my love for you, that which governs all my works. Remember that you have voluntarily entered the thorn-strewn paths and delved into the sinister abyss. You have not responded to my loving call, nor have you listened to the voice of your conscience which is why pain came to your aid, to awaken you, to hold you back, to make you think and return you to the true path. I do not punish you, but I am justice, and as such, I have it felt within all who infringe upon my commandments. For the Eternal One has made his law known to you, and none may change it. See how man laments in the midst of his trials, upon falling into an immensely dark abyss, upon seeing women cry at the loss of loved ones, the children deprived of food, and homes drowning in mourning and misery. Dismayed by his misfortune, he becomes desperate, and instead of praying and repenting of his faults, he turns against me, asking, 
Why would God punish me in this way? And all the while, the Divine Spirit weeps in truth for the sufferings of its children, and its tears are the blood of love, forgiveness, and life. Truly, I tell you, during this time, on account of the development humanity has undergone, man cannot rely on my compassion alone to resolve the situation. He is a victim of himself, not of my punishment, for my law and my light blaze in every conscience. My justice descends upon you to pull up all tares by their roots, and the very forces of nature manifest themselves as enforcers of this justice, so that it appears as though all things are united in an effort to exterminate man, when in reality it is all for the sake of man's purification. But there are some who will err and say, if we must endure such pain, why then do we even dwell upon this world? They have not considered the fact that neither pain nor sin originate from me. Man alone is responsible for remaining ignorant of what justice and atonement are, and that is the cause of his rebellion and subsequent blasphemy. Only he who has studied my teachings and considers my law is unable to accuse his father. The Justice of God You are like bushes, occasionally with branches that are dry and sick, and thus in need of a painful pruning to remove the diseased parts and return your health to you. My justice of love, upon removing from the tree of man the sickly branches that eat away at your hearts, elevates you. When a limb is to be amputated from a man, he groans, trembles, and is fearful, even while knowing that it is being done to remove that which is diseased, that which is dead, that which threatens what might still live. Rose bushes as well, when they are to be pruned, leak sap like tears of pain, but in the end they blanket themselves with the most beautiful flowers. My love, in an infinitely superior manner, trims the evil from the hearts of my children, at times sacrificing even myself. When men crucified me, I covered my executioners with my goodness and forgiveness, and I gave them life. With my words and silence, I filled them with light. I defended and saved them. Thus I removed the evil. I oppose it with my love and save the evildoer. This forgiveness was, is, and will forever be a source of redemption. I cannot pronounce upon you a judgment more severe than your mistakes, which is why I tell you that you need not fear me in any way, but rather yourselves. I alone know the severity, the magnitude, and the meaning of your wrongdoing. Men constantly allow themselves to be fooled by appearances, and that is because they are unable to enter the hearts of their fellows. I, on the other hand, do enter their hearts, and I can tell you that men have come before me, accusing themselves of grave mistakes, supremely saddened for having offended me, and yet I have found them pure. In contrast, others have come to tell me that they have never done harm to anyone, and I know that they lie, for though their hands may not be stained with the blood of their brothers, Upon their spirit, the blood of their victims has fallen, those whose lives they have commanded to be taken. They are those who have thrown the stone and hidden their hand. In my proclamation, as I uttered the words coward, liar, or traitor, their entire being trembled, and many times they have excused themselves from the lecture, for they have felt upon themselves the judging gaze.
if the greatest love of the Father were not present within the divine justice, if his justice did not have its origin therein, then humanity would no longer exist, for their sins and offenses would have already exhausted the divine patience. But it has not been so. Humanity has continued to exist. The spirits continue reincarnating. And at every turn, in every human work, my justice, both love and infinite compassion, has been made manifest. Comprehend my word, so that you will not be bewildered, like many others, by the acts of my divine justice, when I visit a severe judgment upon those who commit but a minor mistake, and in contrast appear to absolve those who have committed a grave error. The Master tells you, if I visit a severe judgment upon one who has apparently made but a minor mistake, it is because I know the weakness of the spirits, and to stray from the path of fulfilling the law may be the first step leading into the abyss. And if I absolve others of a grave error, it is because a great fault is also cause for great repentance of the spirit. Do not judge, do not sentence, do not wish, not even in thought, that my judgment fall upon those who bring about the spilling of blood between the nations. Think only that they, like you, are my children as well, my creations, and they will have to atone for their great faults with equally great restitutions. Truly, I tell you, the very ones you point to as those who mercilessly destroyed peace and led you to chaos shall, in the times to come, become the great sowers of my peace and great benefactors of humanity. The blood of millions of victims clamors from the earth for my divine justice, but above human justice must be mine, reaching each and every spirit, each and every heart. The justice of men does not pardon, does not redeem, does not love. Mine does love, pardon, redeem, reinvigorate, elevate and enlighten exactly those who have caused humanity such pain. I shall redeem and cleanse them. I shall have them endure their great restitution, a crucible within which they purify themselves and awaken fully to the voice of their conscience, so that they may come to contemplate even the gravest of their works. I shall have them take the road traveled by their victims and their peoples. But in the end, they shall achieve spiritual purity, so they may return to earth, to restore and reconstruct all that has been destroyed, to make restitution for all that was lost. You shall know that not death is the moment when your father will judge you, but that the judgment begins as soon as you become aware of your deeds and feel the call of your conscience. My judgment is always upon you, at every turn, be it in your human life or in your spiritual existence. Always are you subject to my judgment. But here in this world, while in the flesh, the spirit becomes insensitive and deaf to the calls of its conscience. I judge you to help you open your eyes to the light, to liberate you from sin and save you from pain. In my judgment, I never take into account the offenses you might have caused me, for amidst my tribunal, hatred, vengeance and even punishment are non-existent. When pain afflicts your heart and befalls your most tender reaches, it indicates to you some error you are committing, to make you understand my teaching and give you a new and wise lesson. In the depths of each of those trials, my love is always present. On some occasions, I have permitted you to understand the reason for an ordeal. On others, you cannot find the meaning behind the visitation of my justice. And the fact remains, in the work of the Father and in the life of your spirit, there exist profound mysteries 
that the human mind is incapable of deciphering. Long past is the time when you were told, with the yardstick with which you measure, you shall be measured as well. How often has this law been used as an excuse for vengeance here on earth, leaving aside all feeling and brotherly love? Today I say to you, I have taken up this rod of justice, and with it I shall measure you according to how you measured others, though I should make it clear to you that the Father, he who loves you ever so dearly, the Redeemer who has come to save you, will be present in each and every one of my judgments. It is man himself who, by his deeds, dictates his own sentences, terrible sentences at times, and it is your Lord who provides help, so that you may find a way to endure your restitution. Truly, I say to you, should you wish to avoid an ever so painful restitution, repent in due time, and with sincere regeneration, guide your life by deeds of love and compassion towards your brethren. Understand that I am the gate of salvation, the gate that shall never be closed to all who seek me with true faith. Now you know that the divine justice is of love, not of punishment like yours. What would become of you if I employed your own laws to judge you, before me, where appearances and erroneous arguments have no value? If I judged you according to your wickedness and used your own terribly harsh laws, truly, what would become of you? In that case, you would certainly be justified in asking me for clemency. However, you need not fear, for my love never withers, changes or passes away. On the other hand, you do pass away. You die and are reborn. You depart and then return, and thus you journey, until the day comes when you will recognize your Father and submit to His divine law.